changes yourself. And we felt like that was the right way to do it. You want to change the system itself, and that's it. So SysADM kind of grew out of that. A lot of the PCBSD tools were starting to show their age. Some of them were quite old and, you know, starting, again, starting to show their age. So we knew that we were going to have to do a refresh of a lot of these tools. So we sat around and we decided, you know what? Why don't we do some kind of unified administration tool? Not just have, you know, a collection of 10 or 12 different utilities, each of them doing one thing for the system. What if you just put them all together? In fact, what if you put them all together is as part of a server client system. This means that theoretically you could log in to your server or your parents server if they're not computer savvy and administrate their system remotely without actually having to drive however long it takes to get to their house to sit at their box to fix their machine if they have issues. So we started working on that general framework and SysADM is the tool that grew out of that. So it comes in three parts. Um, we do have a SysADM server. This is what is FreeBSD specific. Uh, this is the thing that uh, is available. I think it's available in the FreeBSD ports tree right now. We've put a ports, but if not, it should be arriving here fairly soon. Um, and this is the component, like a service, you just start it on your system. It won't make any changes or whatever, but it allows you to listen and let clients connect to it or let scripts connect to it. It lets you do the remote administration part of it. The client is the next piece. This piece is completely cross-platform. This is where we used all our QT experience to write a completely cross-platform client. And I'll talk about this more a little bit later, but that then, that's just one of the clients to communicate with the server to make changes. And then the third component is something we're actually still experimenting with a little bit, and I'll go into more detail later, as a bridge. Basically a way for both server and client to go talk to some public bridge to find each other. So again, I'll go into details later, but those are the three main components of SysADM. So let's talk about the server just a little bit. This is obviously the brains. If you're going to be administrating FreeBSD systems, the server is the one that requires FreeBSD. That's the one that's actually making the changes on the disk. That's the one that's actually modifying the config files. So this is often referred to as a middleware or something that you talk to instead of talking to the FreeBSD system directly. You talk to this service and then that transfers or does whatever it is on the system. Uh, comparable analogs to something like this would be some of those automated deployment systems like what's it, Chef, Puppet, um, might be a few other ones I can't think of off the top of my head, but a similar kind of thing. It's, a, it's quote unquote a middleware. Um, the binary for SysADM itself actually can run in two modes. There's only a single binary, but then depending on how you start it up, you can run it as a standard HTTP slash TCP REST server, where it takes actually standard REST requests with a little bit of JSON to do whatever it is, and that's the interface. Or you can run the exact same thing listening at, through the WebSocket protocols, which also communicates but pure, through pure uh, JSON input and output. I'll go into the differences in those two in a moment, but just keep in mind that there are the two modes. You can run both modes at the same time. So you can run two instances of the same binary in the different, different modes. The web, the web socket server will listen on one port, the REST server will listen on a different port. So that just makes things a little bit easier, but they're running the exact same backend, the exact same utility. So we didn't have to duplicate any effort on the SysADM server side. We wrote it once, and then just depending on the mode, that just handles the front end communications and then redirects it to the exact same backend. Um, the server, I want to point out, and this is the important thing that differentiates it from Puppet or Chef or any of these other systems, SysADM doesn't have a database. It doesn't have some kind of centralized conglomeration of all the information about your system that requires you to use that system if you want to administer the box. If you administer Puppet, or a system with Puppet or Chef or one of these, my understanding is that if you turn that system off and then SSH into the box, your box will be almost impossible to find because none of your configurations are there or applied to the system anymore. You have to run the service because it has its own set of database, its own database of settings and it modifies the system at will to correspond to the database, but it doesn't persist on the system. So if you're not running Puppet or Chef, then you're also not running your system as you think. SysADM takes a completely different approach. We don't need a database. We're just going to modify the system config files exactly as if you were a system administrator logged into the box with SSH running commands, 
to add a line to rc.com or to you know open a port for your firewall or something like that. It's the exact same stuff. So if you make a change through sysadm, you can SSH into your box, open up your config file, and you can see the exact change that sysadm made to that file. It's done the exact same way you would have done from the command line, just making, th and making it an option to make your life easier as a system administrator. So you don't have to use SSH and remember, wait a minute, what was the syntax for this particular file again? You can just do it through sysadm and it will always do that because it has that all built into it. All right, so here's the general flow of the sysadm server. If you have a request for a connection come in from outside, be it from on the local system. If you're on TrueOS, this is actually what we use as the control panel, so it would just be talking to the local system server. Or if you open up your firewall, you can access it remotely and connect from externally. So if my parents, for instance, have trouble with their system, I could go on to mine, initiate a connection to their system, and actually get into Sysadium this way if they gave me permission. Um, first step that comes in with the connection is, first off, authors are doing all the SSL connection handshake stuff to ensure that the connection is encrypted. Everything here always uses either HTTPS or WSS, the secure WebSocket protocol, or the SSL encrypted version of the the standard HTTP. First you go through then, you have to authorize them. After you've done the SSL connection stuff and secured the connection, then you actually have to send some kind of authorization to the server itself. Are you actually authorized to proceed beyond just an initial connection? And there's a pretty strict timeout there as well. So once you've actually done a valid connection, you need to complete an authorization. I think it's within 30 seconds. Um, before, Otherwise it'll say, I'm sorry, you're not, you're not allowed, you're taking too long and it disconnects you. So we pretty stringently have a fair number of security protocols built into this. One of those is blacklisting. If you have some somebody out there in the net who keeps connecting after, what is it, two or three attempts by default, that's the default setting, you can change this later, um, it'll automatically blast it and it'll stop it. It won't even let it make it a connection, connection anymore for at least, I think an hour is the timeout by default. And then they'll have to wait and try again later. But, so we have a pretty strange set of security protocols just built into the server itself. So you're not running um, something like uh, Apache as your web server and then we're just configuring that. No, it's actually a server built into it itself. Um, after that, we have a couple internal systems to the server, such as when you authent authenticate, you need to get some kind of session ID. We way of generating unique session IDs and reporting that back. And, Things like that, or you know, oh, they're trying to log in with an SSL key. Well, let me go through and see which SSL keys I have that are valid for a particular user. You know, doing all that management stuff, all that just simple data administration. The real meat and potatoes of it comes with the next system. That's where it goes down and dials out to what are, what we have as modular classes within the Sysadm server. This is where the real guts of it is. Where it's okay, I want to talk to some particular aspect of the system to make some particular change. So we wrote these in a very modular format so that it's very easy within an hour or two to add a whole new subsystem, whole new classes for doing something completely different with the system. For instance, we could probably write something up for jail management if we wanted to. We have one right now if you use uh, IOCage. We already had an interface and a whole set of API calls for using IOCage on the system. But I mean, it, if, if we have interested parties, it's literally one file you can just open up, start adding new calls, and those will show up on the Sysadm server as possibilities for modification. But here are some of the classes that we have here. We have a user manager, which is basically just a front end to the PW utility on FreeBSD. We have a service manager, which is a front end to the service command on FreeBSD. Uh, firewall manager, this is specifically for the IPFW firewall, not PF. Okay, I just wanted to point that out. Um, the IO cage jails, again, using IO cage. IO hive, if you want VMs, we do have a front end for that. There's still a couple things in there that are kind of weird just because of IO hive. Um, you might have to do some manual stuff to finish up the installation of an IO hive VM, but uh, most of it's all still there, though. Uh, if you need to back up your data, we have life preserver. The back end command is L preserver. Uh, the update manager, so that would be PC update manager if you're on TrueOS. You can also install that on FreeBSD if you want to use that there. Uh, package manager, PKG. I mean, it's all there and there's a whole lot more. We have a full API, uh, website just for API stuff, listing all the classes, all the various API requests, examples of input and outputs of those. So we're trying to make this as easy as possible.
And then after that, once it dials out, does whatever it's thing, what kind of reply do you have? Send that back out in the same format that it came in. So if you sent a REST request, you'll get a REST request or a REST reply. If you sent in a JSON request, you'll get a JSON reply. So it's just sending it through that conversion routine so that you get uh, seamless communications. I just realized I don't have any kind of timer up here, so warn me if I'm going to go long. I do have the tendency to just uh, run out and out. But it looks like I'm doing fine on time. Okay. Um, let's talk about some security. Whenever you're talking about internet facing systems, internet facing servers, security should always be first and foremost on your mind. So I've already mentioned a few of the things that uh, we do to secure the server by default with regards to the authorization and systems. But here's just a few of the other ones that we do. We always use the latest and greatest. TLS uh, transport encryption for your SSL handshake methods. You have to use TLS, period. We don't support any of the SSL, like the three, the twos. It has to be TLS minimum. And then whatever the highest level of TLS is that the two systems can support. Um, the authentication is via a username and password, just like if you're logging into your box via SSH. Or you can register a particular SSL key, a public key on the box and then sign in with that SSL key. And the way that works is the server, you say basically, hey, I want to sign in with an SSL key. And the server says, great, here's a random junk string that I created. It's, you know, however many characters wide or whatever. Please encrypt this and send it back. So basically, it expects the client to use their private key to encrypt the random test string and send it back within a space of, you know, a few seconds or whatever. It should be extremely fast. And then the server says, okay, well, I have all these SSL keys on file, the public keys. Let me go through and see if I can properly decrypt that with one of these known public keys. If so, I associate that with whatever user account is tied to that SSL key, and yes, you're valid. If not, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't decrypt that string, I can't get a match, you must be using some other key, you're denied. So we try to do a full encryption back and forth for things like that without ever uh, exposing public keys. Um, we do have strict connection timeouts and blacklisting. I've mentioned that already. Uh, privilege separation. One of the things is that through the authorization system, I've already hinted at that it registers and checks for users and groups associated with the account that you're logging in with, just like with SSH. It does have an understanding of the difference between operator groups and wheel groups. So if you are in the wheel group, you are considered a full access administrator of that box. You can actually, if you can actually SU to root, then it assumes, okay, you are a full administrator, we'll give you full access to everything that Sysadian can do. If you're only in the operator group, then it says, okay, you still have access to a lot of it, but there are particular things that you are not allowed to do, and it just doesn't list them and doesn't allow you to have access. <coughs> One of those being the ability to modify the known SSL keys for other users on the box. <laughs> so you can only, as an administrator, as part of a wheel group, you will then be able to modify which users are actually allowed and have saved SSL keys on that box and can successfully authenticate with the system. If you're in the operator group, you cannot. Yes? The going through the uh, public key pair, mm -hmm. is that constant time? Or where it would take the same amount of time no matter how many other fails or passes? Or? Um, I'm not sure exactly. I have to go in and look at that. What is this right now? This is all written in C++ with a tiny bit of the Qt core library, which uses like one meg or something like that. And that's mainly for facilitating the WebSocket transport and stuff, because they already have the classes built in for that. There are a few other WebSocket libraries out there that you can use in C or C++. We just picked the Qt one because that's what we're comfortable with. Um, all the extra stuff after that is all added on top of that. That's just to set up the connection or the socket itself. All right, um, oh, and then I mentioned this. There's also the ability to actually disable user name and password authentication with the system and require the SSL key authentication. So this becomes really, really handy later on because when I go into the client, but it actually uses username and password initially and then after successful authentication with username and password is when it registers the SSL cert and then uses the SSL cert after that. So if you disable that, you're basically not allowing new users or new clients to try to connect to that server. It's blocked down until you actually give your cert to the administrator who can then go at it manually. Question, 
how do you get the original uh, public key installed? Um, there is SSH or no? There are a number of different ways for the server. Again, on by default on the box, if you SSH into the box or whatever, there are some command line flags to actually load a cert onto the system, and that's where you can go through and set options. But by default, it does allow username and password initially, and then you can go through and disable that as an administrator after you've already logged in and done all your setup and stuff. Because we don't want to have this thing so locked down that you can't even access it after you first install it. So, <laughs> probably not a good idea. So now let's talk about just a little bit of the differences between the WebSocket and the REST server. I've mentioned again, there's these two modes. So what are the different capabilities and why are there two modes? Uh, they're really for completely different use cases. Uh, most of you are familiar with REST, so let's talk about that first. REST connections are really designed for one-off connections. You connect, authenticate, send a request, get a reply, close the connection. And that's it. So every time you talk to something through REST, you're initiating a connection, going through the whole protocol, coming all the way back and doing it again. With WebSockets, though, it's specifically designed around long-lived connections or persistent connections. That means that you connect to the server, you authenticate, and that authentication stays open as long as the client is actually staying active. There's a 30 minute timeout or something. If we don't hear anything from the client in 30 minutes, then it will go ahead and close it and do that. Um, so the reason that this is so important and why the client uses WebSockets instead is this enables a whole lot of other features. One of them being you can actually get spontaneous events. You will actually get a reply to something you never sent a request about. We call these spontaneous events on Sysadium. One of them being um, the Sysadium server will actually run a health check on your system every 15 minutes. So if you are set up to say, hey, I do want to receive events, there's actually an, an API call for, so that when you connect, you can say, yes, please send me events about whatever it is. The health check is one of those. And so you can actually receive events every 15 minutes telling you what the state of your system is. Are you running out of disk space? Do you have updates available? Are you running into weird disk errors with your zpool if you're on ZFS? Things like that. It gives you a health status on your server. So that by itself is incredibly useful, but then there's other types of uh, systems which are also able to send spontaneous events, but the client actually has to say, when it, when it connects to the server, send a request saying, hey, uh, I want to register for this kind of event. Please send me those types of events. So here's an example of some of the API calls for the difference between WebSocket and server, because again, with WebSockets, it's pure JSON. So we use namespace name, some kind of ID, because when the reply comes back, you need to associate it with what the reply was. Things might come back in different orders, so you always need to associate the ID with whatever it was. And then the args contains you know, whatever data needs for that API request, anything extra. For a REST call, you do something like that instead. Get RPC slash query, where that would correspond to the namespace and name, the HTTP version or whatever, and then your authorization is the base64 uh, username password stuff to do your authentication there. And then again, JSON arguments, which corresponds to this here your arguments field. So there's still JSON mixed in even with the rest of stuff. All right, so that ends the server. Are there any quick questions on the server before I go on to the client? Okay, so let's move on to the client a little bit. I mentioned this earlier, but it is a completely graphical written in pure Qt5 that makes it fully cross-platform. We actually have automated builds for FreeBSD, Windows, and Mac right now. So you can actually go download a Windows EXE or a Mac, what is it, that DMG, or something like that, and run this right now on those operating systems. Um, it also allows for multi-system management. So whereas the server component, obviously, you really only need to run one per box, the client can connect to many different boxes at once. This becomes great when it comes down to those health checks, the spontaneous events that I was talking about. You will actually associate with all your servers and you can just leave that running and it will send you a message if one of your boxes starts having an issue or starts filling up on disk or starts, you know, one of your hard drives starts failing and your zpool status is degraded. Things like that. It'll give you a health status update on that. So that's where the client really comes in handy because it lets you do multi-connections at once and keep them open. Um, we also allow for the possibility of you to set up and arrange your own logical groups of systems. If you have, say, 50 systems, you might want to group them in sets of 10. And the reason being, 
eventually, not right now yet, but we have planned for this, that the operation, the possibility of doing bulk operations across multiple systems at the same time. So if you really are doing large deployments of servers, you can do bulk operations across all of them very easily instead of having to go and modify each one individually, one at a time. Uh, similarly, I, this is kind of a no-brainer, but local host connections don't require internet access. <laughs> um, that's how TrueOS actually gives you the control panel. So if you're in TrueOS and you hit the control panel link, it actually is opening up sysadm on the local system. So it's just the client talking to the local system itself. All right, so again, let's talk about security. What about security on the client? Uh, we generate a unique SSL public-private key pair for the client itself to talk to a server. This is one of the first steps when you set when you run your client and set up connections. The first step is you have to create a key or create a uh, public-private key pair, and it's already within the GUI. You can just type in a couple things, hit create, and it'll create it for you. Um, the next step, it does use the secure WebSocket protocol to talk to all the servers. That's how you get the persistent connections, the events, all of that stuff. It does require the username and password for the first time connection, as I mentioned that. So on the connection manager, when you're saying, okay, I want to set up a connection to some box over here, you give it a location, then you give it a username and password. It will, there's actually a test button, so it will initiate the connection, try the username and password. If successful, it will then automatically register the SSL cert for that client onto that system so that any future connections are done with the SSL tech cert instead of using the username and passwords. Those are not saved in any place. Um, if if there yes. is a SSL certificate established already between, mm -hmm. between the server and the client, uh, and if I'm configuring this ADM for, for the first time, mm -hmm. does it still need a password? Um, well, if you just made the cert on that client, then yes, you are going to need it because you're actually registering a different cert. Um, if you're talking about reusing the same cert from a different client, just pull off on that. I'll mention it in just a minute. Okay. Um, how do we lock down those certs and those public keys though on the host system? Because this is multi-platform, how do we do that? And let me answer one question really quick before I go into that. And then all the certs are tied to users. You're always, yes. What you're doing is always tied to users. Then, right? Yes. The so cert that you are associated with. If there's certs left over, exactly. the access is gone, right? Yes. So you could literally administrate your box with users and groups just like you normally do. The certs are tied to users on that box. Do you have anything below the operator level? No. Okay. We do not allow access to anybody below operator level for the reason being that, again, the SysADM server really is running it through permissions, so they need to have some level of trust to even be able to access and make some of those changes. Because some of the, one of the things available is the addition and removal of packages. If you're not even at least an operator, you shouldn't be allowed to install and remove software on the box. That's kind of the philosophy. So it breaks it down. You have completely, un completely untrusted or you're not even an operator. Partially trusted if you're in the operator group where you can administer some things on the box. You want to install Firefox. You want to install whatever. You can do that if you're in the operator group. Wheel group lets you do all that plus administer all the other users on the system and things like that. Um, so back to the client again though. Um, we actually lock down all of the keys that we generate for the client as well. So you know how we generated that public and private key pair? We actually lock that down because we don't trust Windows, we don't trust Mac, we don't trust that somebody else isn't going to break into your client system. So all of those keys, all of those settings are actually saved within an encrypted uh, bundle, if you want to call it. I think it's a, what is it, PFX12 SSL bundle. And that is locked down with, again, another passphrase just for that client. It's not related to your servers in any way whatsoever. It's just whatever you set up when you're doing that first time setup for your client. That way, when you first start up the client, you click on the tray, it doesn't actually connect to any systems, it doesn't know about the systems until you actually type in your little password in the prompt, and then it will load those settings and then do initiate all the connections to all the various systems. Um, similarly, after that, we have the ability to export and import your settings. This is where you're able to reuse your keys and stuff. Because all the certs are locked down in that bundle, the only way to really reuse that on another system is to export that onto a single file, that's all your settings, that's all your connection setups, it's everything like that, including your encrypted keys, while they're still encrypted, it puts them all within a single file, 
put that on your SVN, put that on some kind of version control so you don't lose it, and then you can then import that into any other client on any other OS to get back all of your settings with the same passphrase locked in uh, bundle and things like that so that then you can then reuse all those same connections to all the same servers. So that lets you basically transfer your settings from client to client without having to recreate the whole thing. All right, so let's actually run through a few examples. The client's graphical, so we gotta show screenshots. Um, so here's the connection manager. Uh, as some of you have seen, if you've actually come by the FreeBSD booth, it looks kind of like this. You can add groups, you can add connections. I have a couple of simple ones there. Um, and these actually are automatically uh, pop up in the menu. If you look below that, you see test group, and then that's its own menu with uh, sample system within it. Um, similarly, if you look down here, again, I'm sorry for the window behind the messages over here, um, but it's basically the yellow tray down there is yellow because I have a message waiting. Not a critical message, which is why it's yellow, it's just a message. Um, and then, in particular, this message is that my local system has updates waiting. So it's like if you click on that, it will automatically launch the configuration wizard for that system on the update manager. Um, and that's with it. So you've got managed connections, you've got some various settings, you can do some theming of it and things like that, change your fonts, stuff like that. Uh, let's actually go to, this is what the main interface when you're looking at a particular system is like. This is what we call the control panel or the front page. Um, the sys servers have a particular API call to list whatever's available on that server. Because it is so modular, it really depends on what's installed on the system to determine what is actually available via API calls. For instance, IOCage and IOHive. If you don't have those two installed, it won't say that that's an option for the server, so those ones just won't show up because they're not listed as possibilities for the API calls at that moment. You would have to go and install those packages after the fact. And there's a few other ones like that too, Life Preserver and stuff like that. Those generally show up under the utilities category down there. Most of the uh, system management stuff is built into it because it uses tools that are always there on FreeBSD systems. You almost never not have PW, you know, and things like that. The service command is built in, PW is built in, a few other ones are too. So a lot, number of these are always there. Uh, here's a sample of the package manager, which we call the App Cafe. Again, borrowing from PCBSD because we grew out of PCBSD, the App Cafe is what we called our graphical package manager. Same thing here, it's basically a front end to PKG itself. In many cases, it's actually faster than running PKG commands from the command line because it's actually reading the package database directly and running a lot, in my mind, smarter searches and faster searches of the package database to find things that you're looking for and stuff. So I've just found, just with some very basic usability and timing stuff, that this seems to be a lot faster about probing and finding information about your packages than actually running the commands directly. Um, and it lets you do all sorts of things. So for instance, here we have the installed tab. It shows you what packages you have installed. These ones are all the top level packages. You can view all the dependencies of all those top level packages if you want to as well through the uh, options button. But one of the things, it also shows flags or statuses for every one of your installed packages. In this case, LibreOffice has a known security vulnerability. So it flags it with a little status icon saying, hey, this one is, has a known security issue. And You'll notice earlier I had a status update saying I had updates available. That'll probably fix the security issue. <laughs> so it, those go hand in hand, but not always. I mean, sometimes you just might need to wait until the next round of packages are done before you can actually install the security vulnerability. But at least you know it's there, so you can stop using the app if you need to or whatever. If it is something that's critical and something that's really important to you, you're at least warned of it. Um, yeah. That's really about all I need to talk about. There, it's a front end of package. Any questions about package? <laughs> all right, well, let's keep going. Uh, the task manager. OK, how many of you use top? Come on, it's a universal tool. Exactly, everybody uses top. Well, this doesn't. <laughs> this is basically a recreation of top for FreeBSD, but it does it using the direct FreeBSD libraries just as top does. So it lets us get the same status updates and the same status information a whole ton faster than actually running top. So that comes important whenever you're doing regular pings and regular checks of it. You don't want to be dialing out to some other tool and having all of its overhead on top of the ping system yourself. So this does pretty much the same thing, but maybe in a little bit nice, nicer visual way. It lists all the processes. You can go through and kill them as need be. 
you can see your CPU utilization, you can see the temperatures of your cores, so you know if things are starting to get a little too warm. Um, you can see your memory usage. If you actually scroll over it, it gives you the stats on all the various categories of memory usage. So you've got active, inactive, wired, there's two other ones I can't think of off the top of my head, but it shows you all that stats as well if you actually want to see the full breakdown. Um, so this is what the task manager is. Basically, it's a visual way of doing top without ever having to SSH into your system. So if you know that you've got some rogue process running 100% CPU and eating up memory, you can just go in there and kill it really, really easily. All right, the update manager. I've mentioned this a couple times. This is a front end, a PC update manager from TrueOS, the PCBSD project. Um, and again, do you have updates available? If so, you can click on it, you can see the updates are available, you can say go ahead and start those updates. It backgrounds it all on the server so you can go ahead and close this client. And in the background, the updates will continue to run, there's the ability to stop updates once they're running. I can't think of really much else to say about it, it lets you update your system. If you don't know about the PCBSD update system, or the TrueOS update system, by all means, stop by the FreeBSD booth later and we can talk to you about boot environments. We'll talk to you about how it does it all safely and reliably and stuff like that. But that's kind of outside the scope of SysADM itself. This is just how you would start updates using that on SysADM. All right, and then the third component was the bridge. I mentioned this before, it is still experimental. Notice the big red morning. It's basically a way to answer these two fundamental questions. What if your server is on DHCP and gets a random IP every time it's assigned, every time you boot it up? How do you find it? Uh, what about servers behind a corporate firewall where you can't access them from a public IP and you're traveling with your laptop and need to keep up and check on your servers? How do you connect to them to check on them? The bridge is designed to bridge the gap. Ha ha, that's where the name came from. Um, so that basically, if you load a bridge on a VM, and like in a cloud service or something, or a DigitalOcean droplet, or you know, Amazon Web Service, whatever, you go ahead and load up this little bridge thing, and then you have your servers and your clients, instead of trying to find each other directly, expecting that they're always static IP, they instead talk to the bridge, and announce themselves on the bridge, saying, hey, this is my name, this is where I am, and so that they can find each other. It's like an announcement server. Um, the bridge is designed to be completely untrusted, though. We don't, because it is statically assigned and you know maybe on a public cloud service or whatever, we don't want to make sure that anything that goes through the bridge could ever compromise your server or compromise your client. So one of the ways that we do that is we use a completely separate SSL certificate when talking to a bridge than when talking to a server just to, again, ensure that it's not listening and trying to crack and get information about how you're talking to your real servers. Uh, the second step is they never actually send your SSL certs to a bridge. Instead, all you do is send the SMD5 sum of your SSL certificate to the bridge. So what this does is this allows the bridge to pair up and say, oh, this server and this client, they both say that they handle the same MD5 sum. They must you know, know each other. We'll We'll tell that server about this client, we'll tell this client about that server, but then it doesn't announce itself to any other ones. So if you have somebody connect to the bridge and send in a random MD5, they're not gonna be told of everything that's connected to the server, that, that's connected to the bridge. They're only gonna be told about the other ones that have the same MD5 for the SSL certificate. So again, it tries to be untrusted, it's not announce everything to everybody. All right, well, let's come to conclusions. It's a new framework designed to assist in the administration of your boxes. It is not designed to usurp the administration of your boxes. It is designed to come along and give you a tool whereby you can maybe have somebody that isn't as familiar with SSH or isn't as capable on the command line to allow them the possibility of administrating some of the boxes as well without hosing all your configs or changing things on the system in weird random ways. This provides a safe way for them to be able to do that as well. But if you have SSH access, if you are good at the command line, it doesn't break the capabilities of you to administrate the box your way either. 
you can still SSH in, you can still administrate it exactly as you would. All you're find is that you know, config files might have different entries in there if they were modified by sysadm because those were the requests. So they tried to work hand in hand with system administrators rather than try to replace one methodology with another. It's trying to be another option for system administrators. Um, sysadm is already used. This isn't just an experimental framework. We have been running this on PCBSD for a little while before the name change, and now TrueOS all the time, every day. It is ready, it is used, it is already used on many, many systems. So while there might be a few features that are somewhat experimental, kind of like the IOHive class that I mentioned earlier, where it will do 90% of it, but it might be one or two steps you still have to do manually, the bulk of it just works. Already tested, already proven on FreeBSD systems, on TrueOS systems. And then I guess I'll just open it up for general questions. I do have a couple links here for the uh, API reference docs. So if you want to script your own access to a Sysadium server, you don't need to use our client. You can set up your own custom scripts, access through REST or WebSockets. You know, it's your choice. But we have that all clearly documented there, all the various classes, examples of everything. I love the docs there. I, that, they're so handy. Even when I'm writing the client, I'm always opening the doc to look at it. And then finally, the TrueOS website where you can go download TrueOS and test it because that is the project where it came from. Yes, uh, Blackshirt. Two questions. <laughs> um, what's the minimum version of FreeBSD that this can be used on? I uh, understand you guys are working on 12. Yes. Does it work on 10 or older versions? Okay, for the purpose of the video here, I'm going to repeat the question really quick. What's the minimum version of FreeBSD? For, that you can run SysADM on. You can run it on 10. We were actually running it on 10.3 with the PCBSD project for a while, even though TrueOS is running off of current. As long as you can install the uh, port slash package on FreeBSD, it might even run on 9. So, so next question with that in mind, yes. is it available out of any of the FreeBSD? Uh, package repositories and stuff? Um, yes. It sh I, I, like I said, I'm pretty sure that we pushed the port to FreeBSD already, um, so you might need to check which package repository you're on to see if it's already built that port or not, because some of them only build every three months, some of them build more frequently, it depends on which repository you're looking at. So just scan your repository and look for SysADM, and that package should be there. Uh, their question. Let me go to somebody else really quick. Yes. Oh, yeah. I was curious about the configuration files. Yes. Because when I SSH into a box, quite often I'll leave notes for myself mm -hmm. inside to remind me of. Do it is when our routines for adding things to configuration files is usually only destructive on a line by line basis. So it will only remove a line if that line was what was requested to remove, which means you will remove the comment if you have the comment in line with that after the fact or something then you will lose that comment. But if you have the comment separated on a different line, like different sections and stuff, then those should be preserved. It should just skip those and continue to apply that and keep that in the file. Yeah. Um, yes. Uh, for the client, is it able to maintain information and to connect for multiple sysadm servers? Yes. So that is part of the thing, part of the settings, is that you can set up and register as many systems as you want within the client, and it will keep those settings. The next time you unencrypt that file within the client, it remembers you had these 10 connections set up, let me initiate connections to all 10 of them to get the status and stuff. So you're always in sync with whatever you have registered. Yes? Um, and like I said there's an API, but have you tested the scaling of your client? Tested the scaling of the client. Hundred boxes. Oh. <laughs> Same time. Um, we have not tested it significantly. I mean, we've done small tests, like five systems at a time or whatever. But I don't anticipate any problems on the client side because every single connection is treated as a distinct entity. So it's not like you're funneling all the traffic through a single flow. It's actually multi-threaded it and stuff. So you, they each get their own dedicated thing. Um, on the server, again, it treats all the connections independently and multi-threads everything. Where that comes in and doesn't work is actually the problems that we're facing with the bridge right now. It was trying to take all the connections and funnel them through the same process before spreading them back out again, and that's what was causing the trouble, and that's why the bridge is still experimental, is we're trying to find 
workarounds and better ways of doing it. Maybe instead of redirecting all the information through the bridge, using it just for announcement and having them connect directly to each other again. So things like that. That's why it's still experimental. That's why we're still working on that one. Yes? And so with the bridge, uh, I know you just said you're, you're looking at changing that, but so you basically then end up with two TLS connections on either side mm -hmm. using the bridges certs that are then mm -hmm. uh, the data is then transferred in the process back and forth. Yeah, they kind of leave it farther. Exactly. Um, so basically you have one connection between server and client, but if there are many servers connected to the server, it's always a one-to-one. -one. So one output for one input here, as many on instances. The server spins them up in multiple threads and everything so that each one has dedicated... Uh, and the server can see the data being passed. Yes. Okay. And then even then, even to speed it up and limit any bottlenecks, even then, as soon as a message comes in from a client, it actually spins up a thread just to evaluate and run whatever request that is, so that even that doesn't slow down anything else on the system, and then that thread is immediately destroyed when the request is finished. So we've tried to be really, really smart about scaling and about multi-threading and stuff with this application. And that's actually one of the reasons why it's taken eight months to get to this, instead of just having it done in two. Yes? Any tests or experiments with some of the uh, embedded appliances based on FreeBSD, like free of FreeNAS, PFSense? Um, we haven't really tried it with any of the other devices, such as FreeNAS or PFSense. Um, I mean, the SysADM server really is quite lightweight because it's not maintaining databases. It doesn't need tons of memory or anything. So, I mean, we haven't really tested it, but I don't see any reason why you couldn't use yeah. it on those other systems. Back up. I'm not familiar with the cockpit project. <laughs> it sounds kind of similar. Okay. Any other questions? Do you have oh yeah, part two was when changes are made using sysadmin mm -hmm. in the uh, file, the actual config file, is there any kind of notation as to what was changed or when or by um, whom? There is not in the config file itself. However, sysadm does have a full logging system as well. So when somebody connects, you can actually open up the log and say, this user connected, this user initiated such and such a change. So you can actually, as a system administrator, get onto the box and view those logs to see and make sure that you know people weren't getting on and doing things that they shouldn't be. Other questions? Thank you. All right. Thank very you very much. much for coming. And I hope to stop by the previous week.